talk is going to be how does a laborer do it? And we talked, we kind of laid the, the tracks in our earlier Sunday school lesson of kind of the vision and values of somebody who's saying, I want to be a laborer for Christ. And so I want to get into more of the practicals of this, but I think as I think about anything uh, great that men want to accomplish, all of it can trace back to a man or woman who had a vision that was very clear and they could see the outcome. You know, I've heard the old Walt Disney uh, quote many times where they were about ready to cut the ribbon on Walt Disney World in Florida and he had already passed away and they looked over to Mrs. Disney and they said, don't you wish Walt was here to see this? And she said, he did. He did see this. This is how he envisioned it. It's, his vision became a reality. And I think when it comes back to personal evangelism and you getting out there and witnessing to the lost, you have to have a clear confidence and vision that God said he would make me a fisher of men. He said that if we go into the world and preach the good news, that he'll be with us. And he said that this was going to be his method, and we know how it ends. We have the whole book. <laughs> And uh, when we opened up the book of Revelations, we know how it ends. And so I want to talk about that, but more specifically even from a personal standpoint of your own vision. And uh, where we get that word vision from comes out of this. Is as believers, each and every one of us all have the same purpose. What's our purpose? Any catechized kids in here? Can they tell me what the chief end of man is? Okay, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Our purpose is very universal for every believer. For every human, it's their purpose. It's whether or not they've uh, been converted and can be obedient to that through Jesus Christ. I like to use uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to kind of back that up, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. We do it all for the glory of God. So for each and every person in in the world, we have the same exact purpose. And that's really where we start evangelism, ultimately, is who is God and what is He like and why did He create you? And so that's a universal purpose for us. But then as believers, after you kind of get your purpose down, after you come to Christ and start realizing this is why I'm here, I'm here to glorify God, then you move into, okay, what's my mission? That's kind of what we're even talking about today. The next question is, okay, what's my mission? What am I here to do? How do I glorify God? What's the mission He's calling me to? And what is our mission as Christians? It's very great. That's right, the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And, uh, you know, the thing about this is, This is our purpose, so whatever we do, we need to do it, make sure it lines up with that. But then another non-negotiable universal truth for all believers is we are all called to be on mission. There's no uh, disclaimer in the Great Commission that, you know, Pastor Lee and guys like him go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. It's a, it's a very clear mandate that that's who we are as believers, his first words to his disciples, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. His last words before he ascends, go and you'll be empowered to go to Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. I mean, this is real important stuff here, folks. It's all he talks about. Everything comes back to it. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be given to you as well. Universal things that we have to, when I'm working with college students, you know, me and Daryl were just even talking on the way up here and we're thinking through, he's about ready to graduate, different things. We're filtering, everything has to go through those two things, but then kind of where he is, even as a graduate getting ready to go to the next season of his life, it comes down, it gets a little more fuzzy. Because as you're being obedient to these two things, then you come into your personal vision. You start asking yourself, okay, 
I'm living my life with the conviction that no matter what I do, I want to do it for the glory of God. I've realized that the Great Commission is not uh, an optional thing for believers, but it's something that it's a command from God. It's a lordship decision just like anything else uh, that he commands us to do. But then I think the thing that we have to start to wrestle with is, well, what's, how has God wired me up to be, live out those two things? What gifting has he given me? What is the body of Christ telling me I need to do to make the most impact? And uh, as we start to figure those things out, and as I work with college students that come to Christ and kind of counsel them as they get ready to graduate, and even now as I counsel different buddies my own age who are going through career transitions and things like that, I'm always coming back to, well, man, if we've gone through the disclaimer of your purpose and your mission, how's God wired you up and what do you see? What do you see God doing in and through your life? What is the, your local body of Christ telling you you're gifted at and pushing you out there to do? And as we do those things, I think those are the things that are going to have you persevering in building convictions to be a person who shares their faith consistently. Because some of you on here are an evangelist. You know what I mean? There's just no doubt you could just talk to a wall. You know what I mean? It's just nonstop. You can get a conversation going. And that's, you know, clear. So you got to start thinking, okay, I'm an evangelist. It's like I, I sneeze, people come to Christ. You know what I mean? It's just like everywhere I go, it's like, Okay, my pastor's telling me maybe I should start up this, you know, youth outreach over here on the south side of Jackson. And, do, you know, all these different things are coming up. And you, but you've got to kind of formulate your, uh, your own personal vision. Like, well, what do I see happening? What do I see? Uh, what outcome could I see God doing in and through my life? Or maybe you're not as outgoing, but you have a conviction you want to learn. You're going to learn how to a gospel presentation. You're going to do some things. But, I mean, you're just really gifted at, uh, you know, accounting. And you're going to be the best accountant you can possibly be over at Union in the accounting department. And you're going to make sure that every relationship that you interact with, you're going to start some. So I'm going to try to get this accountant's investigative study going on. Is there a God? And if so, what is he like? And so you start talking to people and you start to have, formulate this vision on how that could happen. Or maybe you're a stay-at-home mom and you've got these kids, but there's these other kids running around the neighborhood who... Who knows what they're being taught at their home. And so you start to create this little backyard Bible study and invite other moms to come and because you just have the gift of being hospitable and you start to formulate your vision. You understand where I'm going with this is if you start to see those things and you're living within the gifts God has given you and you're taking advantage of the situation the Lord has put you in, all of a sudden evangelism becomes something you're really interested in because you realize I'm the answer. I am the laborer that those disciples were praying for when they saw the crowds. I can put myself into the situation and see God using me to lead others to Christ. I just got to learn how. I just, got, I just need some training. I just need some, uh, some promises from God's word that help me overcome the fear I have. And quite frankly, I just need to step in there and do it. And so I wanted to start with that because that, that's an illustration that I just nonstop come back to with people. Whether it's, hey, what dorm should I live in? I want to share my faith. What major should I do? Uh, what should I do after I graduate? And it really translates over to all of us. I just happen to use this in the college world. So let's move on here. When I think about evangelism, there's really two different types. So as you start to realize, hey, I have a vision and there's some things I want to do and move forward with to have a kingdom impact and reach people for Christ, there's really two parts of evangelism I want to talk about. One is the event of evangelism. Okay, this is the cold call sitting in the... Uh, airplane next to a guy sitting in line at Walmart and they're all backed up. It's like, why do they only have two registers open? I don't know. It's super Walmart. You know, and it's like, you just want to be ready in season and out to talk about Christ. And so the first thing I want to say about this letter A there, I think it has letter, maybe it has letter A in your outline. 
is know how to share your personal testimony. Know how to share your personal testimony. I think as I've, I'm trying to think how many people I've probably, every summer we run a training program for college students called the Mountain Project in Pigeon Forge. To where we started realizing was on campus we're seeing 30, 40, 50 people come to Christ in a year on the college campus and then they go home and work their job and they come back and they're just sucking spiritual wind. <laughs> they this you know, I believe in eternal security. They didn't lose their salvation, but man, they they definitely come back not as healthy as they could have if they were being discipled all summer. And so we started create we created this summer training program called the Mountain Project where we get them jobs at the prestigious Dollywood. Any college students talk to me afterward. I know that probably sold you. Um, they work there all day, then in the evenings we do evangelism training one night, inductive Bible study training the next night, free night, and then we have small groups and evangelism where we go out and share our faith with complete strangers for three hours in Gatlinburg. But the first thing I do when I'm giving my evangelism training is I have a testimony workshop. And I've had more positive feedback from that than any other gospel presentation. And I've done, we'll talk about a bunch of those here in a little bit. But really just, when, when somebody really understands the gospel on a doctrinal level, kind of like Lee was talking about in the service this morning, like, okay, I understand God's holy, I'm not, Jesus Christ, you know, the resurrection, repent and believe, all those things. Once somebody can communicate their testimony in a simple and quick and interactive way, it opens the door for so many more conversations. And so one of the things I would just encourage everybody in this room to do is go ahead and, and get with somebody. I know there's guys in this room who, who would help you in a heartbeat. And write down and have your personal testimony kind of canned in a way where you can present that thing in 30 seconds to a minute. And at least open the door. And you know what? They may get up there and then all of a sudden it's their turn. They buy their ice cream. They leave. You never see them again. But who knows where it could go? That's where the vision part comes in. Because I have a vision that as long as I'm planting myself in this community, in this place where God's called me to, I'm just going to left and right be ready to share. And so I, I say this just assuming, well, we're in all these good churches and you know, getting all these good teaching and everybody knows, they're, you know, that's such, you know, kindergarten, you know, stuff spiritually when they're, we have, but a thing I found is it's just not true. It's not. I think I could go up to Louisville, Kentucky right now and just walk around Southern Seminary and just start asking people their personal testimonies or say, hey, man, let's go down to, uh, Bar, what is it, Barstown Road or whatever the name of it is, and let's just go, sharp, and they'd be like, oh, man, personal testimony. Can I do that? I don't know. Where do I start? I mean, do I have it correct in my head? You know what I mean? It's like, no, you need to have this to where it's just like breathing for you. And the only way that happens is just to jump out there, get it written down, and practice it a little bit with somebody who can give you some feedback and just start sharing it as much as you can. And it will open up so many doors. So many doors will be open as you do that. It's irrefutable, and it really is just a spiritual icebreaker to get in the conversation. B, the next thing is be trained in a presentation. Be trained in a presentation. <laughs> um, I think I know the kind of crowd I'm with here, and, and if you're anything like me, so, sometimes that just there's something uh, mechanical and uh, maybe too pragmatic about that terminology, but I would say get over it. Because I, you know, I was talking to somebody today, and I said, man, I'd rather have a guy who just, every time he opens his mouth, he says, do you know God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? And goes through the three other spiritual laws. I'd rather ha have that guy who's just sharing it like crazy with anybody he can talk to than the guy who knows all the theologically and maybe doctrinally wrong things with that presentation and doesn't share with anybody. And I say that as... Uh, a beggar talking to other bankers when it comes to figuring out how do we do this. 
but uh, Nike has the, the, the slogan that we all need to just run to. So, I mean, we just need to get out there and just do it. And so that being said, find a good presentation that you can memorize and have, be comfortable with because what's the number one thing that keeps us from sharing our faith, if we're being really honest, is what? Fear. Fear. We're afraid. You know, I'm a big uh, Way of the Master fan. It's kind of like dated now, I guess. I chose some college guys. They're like, golly, man, that Australian or New Zealand guy, he just sounds weird. You know what I mean? And, but they always say as they're teaching their evangelism tool, the Way of the Master uh, presentation, if you can just get something in your mind that you're confident and you have a grid that you can run through, it takes away 50% of the issue of the fear factor. Because you just have something that you can go to, and you, no matter what the responses are, you can just say, okay, I'm moving through this grid and this presentation. And, uh, you know, like for us, we, uh, there on the campus, we use different things. We use the way the master, like I talked about. We have the bridge illustration, where we take Romans 6.23, just one verse, and can share the full gospel. And it's real easy to get into. And I, you, know, you, you should be see people's faces when you say, hey man, if I could explain the whole Bible in one Bible verse, would you be interested to hear it? And they're like, yeah man, I don't even believe the thing, but sure, you know. And uh, the funny thing is about the gospel, when somebody says, I don't believe it, man, that's, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I love it when they say that because I'm like, oh, excellent. Well, man, let me tell you what Christians believe. You see how easy that was to transition right into it? I, I don't, that's okay if you believe or not, but you can say, man, that sword that you have, I don't believe in swords. So I was like, okay, cool, let's just stab you with it. And uh, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not, but we're going to see what happens. And God's word is a double-edged sword. And as we get that gospel presentation down, you know, if you're not comfortable with one, make up one. <laughs> Bill Bright said they're giving him a hard time about the four laws. This is it's nothing new that us and our circles have done, you know, making, giving the four laws a hard time. Back in the day, they were giving him a hard time. He's like, man, hey, come up with one better, and I'll start using that one. And I was like, man, that was a good comeback. <laughs> you know, it's like, all right. And so get a effective presentation that you can get comfortable with and then become a, an expert at swinging conversations into that, taking it from the weather to, you know, what would keep you right now from receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. And you know, I would, my prayer is that the local church, there would be just a, a revival in a sense among the body of people who are, who are just sharing their faith with every chance they get, sharing their testimonies every chance they get. And it wouldn't just be all about, well, man, I'm looking for a place where I can go be missional and use missional like 14 times in my sentence and just go there. And, and then once I get some cool skinny G's on, then I'll be, you know, then I'll share some of the stuff and we'll get it. It's like, man, you know what? I like what Lecrae says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He got that from Paul. And you just share it and you share it and you share it. And you know what? Then you realize, man, these, they're, they're open, they listen to me, but no one's embodying it, so I need to go move to this place where all these people I'm sharing with are coming from, where I need to do some things in my neighborhood that get some more relationships built because I'm sharing it and they're, they're nice and they listen to me, but I want to talk more, but if all I do is just you know, share it every time I'm with them, it, it doesn't keep you from being relational. It makes you more relational if you have the Holy Spirit. You know, if we're really believing that God is sovereign over the conversion of souls and that he sovereignly works in and through the believer, through the, the Holy Spirit working through you, then the more you share the gospel, you're going to be convicted through the fruits of the Holy Spirit to also love them more aggressively and embody and, and be the living Christ in the flesh for them who comes on their turf through that and then see I think as you do that you just know how to point them to their next step you've learned how to share your testimony you're doing that you've learned how to swing it into a gospel presentation but then just knowing how to point them to their next step for me it's, I'm usually a hey check out the book of Romans guy 
And because uh, if you can just get them to get into God's word, and if it's a you know on a plane in Albuquerque, I'm never going to see them again. Hey, take my pocket Bible. There's one in your hotel room tonight. Just read the first three chapters of Romans. Maybe the first chapter of Romans, and hopefully they'll read more. And you know, have a, in your mind have something that you're leaving them with. If it's here in the community, okay, start thinking. Okay, how how can I lead this to another conversation? I just met this person over here at Best Buy. From the looks of them coming over to church, I'll invite them, but maybe I can invite them to church, but also like, hey, uh, here's some things me and some other guys do. We play basketball on these days. But have some in your mind, and if, there, if there's no connection or event or thing you can lead them to, I would go and talk to some people and say, hey, where's some things that we can, next steps we can do to bring people into our community and start creating those things. So have some next steps that we go into. And then lastly, there on the, under that point of uh, point them to their next step is try to meet them again. Is another reason why we should be sharing our faith any second we have and train ourselves up so we can overcome the fear because we're confident in the presentation is because more than likely you actually will have a chance to meet up with them again. I was walking through campus one day. We had a prayer meeting at, in Arkansas State when I was working there about five years ago. And I was walking to the CAF to meet some baseball players who I was evangelizing and interacting with and had a Bible study with. I was walking through campus and there was a guy sitting on the bench. His name was CJ. And I was walking by, never seen the guy in my entire life, and I walked by and he was just alone, no one else was around, and you could just have that moment of God saying, hey, you should share the gospel with this guy. It wasn't an audible voice, don't worry. But just a conviction, like, man, that guy's just sitting there by himself, no one's around. I walked by him, and I said, okay. Turned back around, this is going to be awkward, but you know what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. <laughs> I sat down and said, hey, man, I'm just a campus minister on campus. You got five minutes to answer a few questions. I just love to share this story with people. Went through the gospel with him. He looked up at me after I got done. He's like, man, I was going to commit suicide last night. My girlfriend broke up with me. I think I'd like to receive Christ right now. Now, is that going to happen every time? No, absolutely not. I hope it does. If it does, keep doing it. And that guy ended up coming around, came to our events, got involved, uh, and became a member of his local church. And I just think about how many CJs are out there <laughs> that we could be interacting with and that I was, you know, how, and how many of those can we be following up with and they could, all of a sudden they could be the person who really reaches out to, they have way more lost friends than I have, you know what I mean, if the guy we just led to Christ and man, what could happen? How could it change the dynamics of our church and our community and the ones we move into to go start new churches and new gospel communities. If we just say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to be selective here. I'm going to be very unconditional on who I go around and just share my faith with. If they're breathing, if they'll listen, let's do this. <laughs> and obviously some are going to be more gifted than others, but I think as long as you're saying, God, just use me. I'm available to you. I was talking to a, a 90, I think he was, at the time, he was still young, like 89. I think he's 100 years old now. But he was uh, one of Dawson Trotman's disciples and the original navigators. And uh, I was at some event or something like that. And I asked him, his name was Jim Downing. I was like, Jim, you've been, how many times have you shared your faith in your life? He's like, oh, I can't, I don't know, too many to count. You know what I mean? I was like, well, what's the secret to being still, I mean, he was sharing stories about the week before sharing his faith on the plane. You know, this old, slow moving man he's like be available just tell God anytime any place I'm available if you start praying that though don't send me hate letters because it will happen really awkward situations but you'll be so blessed even if, because here's the thing I found there's two things that happen that once you get done doing them you never regret it taking time to pray and taking the time to share your faith with somebody. 
Both of them you hate, and there's this, this enormous spiritual warfare going on right before you do them, in a sense. Like, oh, man. <laughs> but when you're done, you never regret it. And when it comes to sharing your faith, regardless of the outcome, I promise you, if you stepped out on faith and you just said, oh, I'm going to go for it. Hey, man, what would you do tonight if you died? You know what I mean? And they just, you know, turn their nose up at you, call you bad names, walk away, spit on your shoes. I promise you, you'll be so excited. <laughs> you may be a little burdened. You may be a little embarrassed. But, man, at the end, you're going to be like, man, that just happened. <laughs> wow. I'm ready to talk to the next guy. It can't be any worse than that. <laughs> and so I, I know it may seem elementary in many ways. For me, it's elementary. It's like, man, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm like teaching people how to do this. But still, every day I, I have to make a decision. Lord, I don't feel like talking to this guy, but you just tell me to. I'm going to go back and talk to him. So I don't think we can hear that enough about just being in a position where, you know what, I'm just going to be somebody who shares my faith in the event, in the moment, any time that you present the opportunity, Lord. And if you're not there, be committed to getting the training and asking God to put you in the place where you can do that out of your uh, own conviction. So that's one. And the second, I will spend a little more time on it, but I just wanted to make sure I hit on that. Our third, I guess, point here is the process of evangelism. The process of evangelism. <coughs> Maybe some other terminologies or whatever you might have is like <coughs> relational evangelism. People that you're going to have ongoing relationships with. You know, maybe for, you know, are, are the Salt Lake City people here? Somewhere? There you are. Man, you guys are like my heroes. When I heard that story, I was like, man. You know, so when you're moving into a new community or where, this is more what we're going to be talking about here. Hopefully you're sharing your faith any chance you can get. That's great. But at the same time, you're also planting yourselves. Maybe you're already planted in your cul-de-sac or your part of town or your dorm or wherever you are, your workplace. But then you start asking, okay, what's, What's the process of this all? Obviously, you know, I'm going to share my faith. And here's what I mean by this. I don't like the, the, the phrase relational evangelism in our culture, at least our Christian subculture, is very negative because what it means is, is I'm going to get to know you for this long extended amount of time before I ever tell with you the most important thing that will change your life. Great friend. And so I, I don't like to use that term. I like to call it process evangelism. And here's the thing. Ray Comfort says this all the time. He's like, man, I can become a friend with somebody in 10 seconds if I'm just nice. <laughs> if I don't come up and just say, hey, you're going to burn in hell. You know, if that's not your first words, you can probably find some other words to go ahead and connect with a person on something. But there is, at the same time, a process. But I think what sharing your faith indiscriminately does, it kind of helps you immediately see where they are. And so, you know, again, I'm from Indiana, so there's certain things that attract me and get me fired up that most average people don't like. But, man, one of the things that I just get pumped about, and one day if I ever win the lottery I'm going to get one, is a zero-turn mower. <laughs> I mean, there's not even a steering wheel on that thing, man. It just has two levers, and you just go. And, uh, you know, what I love about those things is just how they turn so tight and everything is so smooth. But... On that skid steer, is that right, mechanical engineers in the room? You know, the, thing, the way it works is you can't get too much of one or the other or you're just going to be doing what? <laughs> going in circles. And so we need to be relational. We need to be incarnational and, and really go in and, and move to Salt Lake City or move to the bad part of Jackson or go in that dorm where all the athletes live and they're partying all the time or whatever it is. We need to go there and we need to love on them. We need to serve them. We need to do all we can to truly win their smile, win their affections, and, and be a service to them in any way we can. But if all you do is you focus on that, and I don't care what your motive is, if you only do that, 
you're just going to be spinning in circles and make no progress. Because you have to have truth. Now at the same time, we know that if we just come in and immediately, you know, I'm not against street preaching, standing on the corner and just shouting it out. I mean, it's better, you know, some places just need that. But if that's our only go-to method, I think it's been very proven in missiology. You know, I, I mean, I think Hudson Taylor would tell us, hey, you know, that's great that you want to come do that in China, but it's not going to work if you go back and interview them. But there's a certain level of you can't just go in there full throttle just preaching truth all the time nonstop. And then, oh, yeah, there's that verse, Jesus came full of grace and truth. And so I think what the process of evangelism is, is figuring out how to do both these things where I'm not going in circles one way or the other, where I'm this Mr. Westboro Baptist Church guy over here, and I'm not this loving you straight to hell guy over here. But I'm, you know what, I'm making some progress, and I'm not inching along even. I want to get this thing out where I know how to go out full throttle, full of grace and truth. And I think that's what I want us to think of when we think of the process of evangelism. So step one is this. This is going to be very, uh, probably more on the strategic side of things as you think about this. So kind of go through that filter. I think letter A there is identify a target. As you've grown and had to share testimony, share the gospel, direct people towards things, you start to get a heart that you want to really live out your vision as you're obedient to these things. I think one of the biggest things that the local church body that we don't do is we don't really strategically pick a target. There's that old phrase, you aim for nothing what? You'll hit it every time. <laughs> and I wish the church would really just believe that. I think so many times we have resources, we have energy, we have desire, we have the, the human capital to do so many things, but we just program the thing to death and there's this no target that we're going after. And when I think about this, I think as you look at the ministry of Christ and the ministry of Paul, and as you go through the book of Acts, there were some real decisions and thoughts being made there. If we're going to st start this thing in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. This is kind of the map I'm making out here. There's a real strategy and targeting direction behind this. Peter, we're going, to build, we're going to build this on you, the rock, and you're going to preach it to the, to the Jews. And then Paul, you're going to be the guy who goes out to the Gentiles. And then Paul's out there, hey, I'm making a plan. I'm going to try to go over here east. But then he has this dream, come to Macedonia. And so he goes that way. And the, I think as you look through it, there's a lot of strategy going on there. And I know that's very gray, and I'm not trying to make any just hard line in the sand on how that all works. And, but I really think if we're going to put so much energy into so many things, why would we not think through, okay, where are the parts of town that are the darkest? We have light. Let's go take light there. And let's get a strategy and put our money and our prayers and our thoughts and as many things as we can towards that. And then I think you backtrack that as the church is doing that, then all of a sudden that's going to trickle down to our people also, right? And they're going to say, hey, you know what? I work in this place. All the people around me, I'm burdened for them. I'm not going to try to reach the whole department store. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to work in the electronics section over here where I'm interacting with these people every day. I'm going to do a few things, maybe start up something to, where I buy lunch every Friday and anybody who wants to come and talk about, you know, different viewpoints of what's, what happens, you know, spiritually to a person after they die. And just see, man, I'm, I'm going to try to fail ten times, <laughs> which is really what ministry is. So if you want to sign up, be ready. I'm just going to go out there and try different things within my target that I naturally have an affinity for and am with consistently. And ultimately, I think you'll see some different things happen. I have friends doing this all over the place. You know, there's a reason, even at Tennessee Tech, you know, people are always like, man, why don't you guys have a building on campus? You could build a building there and have foosball and have people come in all the time and all these things. They're like, man, because that's not our target. 
We don't want to build a building because guess what? We'll have to be there all the time. But those girls and those guys and the last place they're ever going to come is a religious building. And those are the people that we want to meet. We're targeting those people so that because I'm targeting them, it all of a sudden influences my decisions I make and emphasizes on, and puts a conviction on my heart, well, I need to know how to interact and share with them and talk to them and find out what their questions are and have answers for those things. And you see where all that goes. It just leads to, in a, in a, form, in a lot of ways, just fruit. And so uh, I have friends planting churches in downtown Indianapolis and in downtown Detroit in Memphis I have friends who are school teachers who are trying to use their math degrees that they got from Murray State University to interact with students that they share the, their, the gospel and their testimonies with. I have, and the ones that I see that are really starting to make disciples and lead people to Christ and disciple them and then train them to turn around and do the same thing are the guys who have a real clear strategy and a target behind what they do. So that's the first letter A there. B. Once you have kind of picked your target, I think you move into forming a contact within there. So, for example, uh, we started the ministry at Middle Tennessee State University. And uh, if you know anything about Middle Tennessee, it's not this bastion of moral values. Uh, middle is your kind of your st typical state school. And like Tennessee Tech, it's a state school where I'm at, but... Everybody that goes there has known they wanted to be an engineer since seventh grade. And they all come from a probably pretty sheltered background where they really were made to do their math homework all through high school or they're not going to be an engineer. And so it's a, a little bit more conservative even though it's the state school. But you go down to Murfreesboro, Tennessee and to MTSU and it's like, man, there's like 42 shades of hair color when you rock around campus. Um, you know, everybody's got some kind of, you know, <laughs> Uh, passion in their life that they're trying to make known, like don't kill these monkeys here or something like that there. Or whatever it is, it's just all something that they're fired up about. And so we got on the campus there, we're like, man, this is a huge campus. You know, there's signs everywhere, largest university in the state of Tennessee. It's like they have one more person than UT or something like that. And uh, it's like, but it is, it's 23,000 people. Where do we start? And so we are like, okay, well, let's we're targeting the college campus because we believe if we go there, we can you know, export laborers in every field of profession there is. So we kind of got the target thing down. Okay, we're on the campus now. Where do we target on here? All right, the Greek system seems like they run every social event on campus. So let's get some people in the Greek system. You know, people pay thousands of dollars to go watch the athletes. So let's get in with the athletes. You know, hey, these international students, it's like, man, they're coming to us. <laughs> you know, we can interact and talk to them. We don't have to go there, so let's make sure. So we have our targets on the campus, but then we move into, okay, well, now we've got to build contacts. And that's where we start to say, okay, old man, it's one thing to say I want to reach football players. It's a whole other thing to go up to a table of these dudes. <laughs> I mean, there's a big old huge 300-pound offensive lineman and D-lineman and stuff and be like, okay, hey, man, are you a good person? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, oh boy. But then you keep showing up every day because there's people that support you so you don't have to go back to work and then come back at night and you're showing up every day and then you talk to the coach and you make a contact with him and then all of a sudden there's these two or three guys that are like, man, you know what, I've been thinking about what you're saying and it's like, man, I, I think that little team devotional thing that you were talking about starting up, let's do it. So we start up a little team devotional, and two or three guys come, then one of them one night comes in and says, hey, man, I can't get over the fact that you really just ticked me off the other day and told me if, um, if I were to die, I'd be separated from God and hell forever, but you're right, man, so I need to just give my life to Christ. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's good. And all of a sudden, I got this contact, and then I start saying, well, man, hey, Johnny, you know, you just came to Christ. Let's go get involved with the local body of believers and join the church and and as he starts growing, he starts wanting to bring his friends. And all of a sudden, that one gospel conversation that I was convinced I needed to learn and present and interact and that target I made and that contact, all of a sudden it's turning into a potential for a movement on the football team. Which will in turn, we trust God will be a movement on the 
campus, which we trust will in turn be a movement that goes into the Nashville metro area and around the world. And that's nothing special for the college campus. That can happen. I mean, when you think about Jackson, Tennessee and the influence it has over West Tennessee, when you think about Salt Lake City and the influence it has over that whole state and the largest single missions movement in the whole world, unfortunately, for a pagan cult, whoa. Man, if we can just go in there and get, we've targeted it, we've gone there enough, if we can get that contact. God, just raise up just that one guy. I mean, and it always was God's way. It was always that one contact. Hey, Abram, we're going to change your name. Moses, Noah, Joshua, <laughs> Peter, Paul. It was like, it was always the one guy. That's all God needed. He didn't even need that, but it's just what he chooses to do. So you go in and you build that contact. And a quote that I've heard said kind of in our circles is, meet everybody, share with everybody, but look for that somebody. I don't mean like the cool guy with the most influence. You know, it may, may or may not be the case. But who is it? God, who are, I'm just going to get out here, but who is that person you're going to raise up? Who's the contact person? And sometimes I've had lost guys be that contact who just opened the door for me. And they ended up not coming to Christ and transferring away, and I never see them again. But, man, they introduced me to 30 people on that dorm floor. And that could easily happen in your neighborhood or your workplace. The next one. Present the gospel. <laughs> it all comes back to that event evangelism, too, in some ways. But in that process of evangelism, as you're starting to do this in a place where you're going to see people for sure more than once, you've identified your target, you've made a contact, and now you're getting in there and you're presenting the gospel. You're saying, you know what, I'm going to be sensitive. And if, it's, if they're, I share with them my testimony and they immediately went to 15 reasons why the Bible is not true and they saw this show on the Discovery Channel and, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to go to, have them over for brownies. My wife's cooking. You know what I mean? Okay. And this guy, I shared with him, and he's like, man, you'll never believe this, man. I've been studying my, reading this Bible that this Gideon guy gave me last semester, and it's like, I've just been waiting for somebody to tell me, what does this stuff mean? And you're like, okay, I'm going to go with some truth for him. He's looking for it. And so as you get in there and make some relationships and you build these contacts, start just sharing the gospel as much as you can in creative and sensitive ways. The more we do that, the more it kind of gives you the, the kind of spiritual temperature of the place that you're targeting and making contacts with. Um, I think the whole in-season and out thought behind that is important. And, you know, Hebrews 11.6, without faith it's impossible to please God, I think is an important promise that you have to come back to as you're going down your evangelistic endeavor. You have to really believe that, man, okay, I'm here. You've given me a vision for this place. You've opened doors. There's, I, I have relationships. i got to believe that the gospel really have faith that this really is the only way. I have to step out and believe some things I don't see. Like, man, if I share with them, I'm going to lose my only contact. I don't see anywhere where that, that disclaimer is there in God's Word. Paul didn't pay attention to that one. Now, don't get me wrong. Yeah, we, we're all things to all men in any way we can be, but I think we have to get in there and say, okay, I'm, I'm, going, to have a I'm going to have a top ten list of people. I'm going to keep track. Okay, I shared the bridge illustration with him. My next conversation, I think you still try to go through, you know, the first part of Genesis to look at the why God created man, what our purpose is. Man, that last one was really heated. He got kind of, I need to have him over, and we're just going to, my wife's going to cook her secret lasagna, one of the greatest evangelistic events of 
at our house and we're going to have them over and let that lead to the next one and I'm keeping track and uh, man that list is up to like 10 people now that I've, I'm keeping track of and I'm putting as much effort into my friends and my people and I'm neighbors and target areas that I'm trying to lead to Christ as I am you know the masters today and if Bubba's going to win or not and I'm really putting some effort into this thing and I'm really getting the gospel out there and then as you do that, I think what that leads into is what I think this church is probably really good at and a lot of our churches in the movement is just getting them into evangelistic Bible studies. Where do I put it there? Investigate the scriptures. D. So you've identified a strategic target. You've made contacts in the areas that you felt like are the strategic ones to do that in. You're sharing the gospel in those areas and seeing the people's responses. And as you start to see different people's responses, you realize, okay, I can start formulating a small group Bible study out of this and unleashing the scriptures, the double-edged sword on them, whether they believe it or not. <laughs> and as we do this on the campus, last, how many evangelistic Bible studies did we have on campus last semester? I think we had 50 evangelistic Bible studies going on on the campus at Tennessee Tech last semester. And uh, when it's all been said and done here, we have about three more weeks of school. I think we've had 60-something people make professions of faith come to Christ. And as we take those numbers of those people and the people who are in evangelistic Bible studies, it's in the 90 percentile. And I just do not believe that that's a coincidence. Because I think so many people that we're sharing with, we're immediately trying to funnel them into these small groups where they can interact with some of their friends and neighbors and different things and even come and make it an atmosphere where they can ask questions and, 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 and walk away thoroughly evangelized through going through God's Word. And so we have different four-week evangelistic Bible studies and... Um, you know, nine times out of ten, the evangelistic Bible studies that we do on the campus, we don't have it in the Christian guy's room where he has the third day posters and all the, you know, cool Christianese, Christianese things all, all over the place. We do it in that dude's room who have posters that I can't even talk about with some of the kids in the room. And we do the Bible study in there. And guess who comes? Even if no one else comes, guess who's there? Those two guys. But... You know what's beautiful is when you're in a room and you have, you know, the 2014 bathing suit team posters up on the wall and you go in there and all of a sudden you look up and you realize, man, I'm in this room where I can't even look up for my Bible. But all these guys are, just went through all of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and looked at what it meant to be a new creation. And those small group studies, I mean, all of a sudden, they'll come every week because it's in a comfortable place. The only thing uncomfortable about it is that the Bible's there and that I'm there because I'm the smell of death to some people and life to others. But, you know, it's amazing how many people, if, if, if I just open up the scriptures, it'll impact. But I'm doing it, again, on their territory, in their territory, in their comfort zone. But I'm making sure that I'm getting them in the scriptures. You know, I, I joked earlier just about, you know, even simple little things. You know, it's like some of these college guys, sorry college guys, if there's anybody here. It's like, man, they come up with some horrible names <laughs> for some of the things to do. Like, come to my Bible study. <laughs> you know what I mean? Come to my, uh, you know, let's talk. Who is Jesus? And all these different things. It's like, man... Those guys see right through that. Most of the lost culture people that were around, especially in the South, they've made a willful decision not to, to avoid those things right now. I don't think there's anything wrong with kind of tweaking it a little bit and saying, hey, we're going to have an investigative spiritual discussion. We're going to, you know, walk in here. We're going to talk about, hey, man, what's your worldview? Uh, what does that even mean? <laughs> you know, and uh, just coming up with different catchphrases and things like that, I think just to be real practical here of things you can do. And, you know, you may know your context. Bible study may just 
be no problem. And I don't think you're trying to bait and switch anybody, but I think it's the thing where you're trying to meet people where they are in order to get them in the scriptures. E. Challenge them to a decision. You know, one of the biggest struggles I have in my gospel presentation, and I think everybody has, is you go through it, but I think we're sometimes afraid to really challenge them to make a decision. And I know in our uh, Bible Belt, Southern, you know, we're in the belt buckle of the Bible Belt here in Tennessee. We don't want to coerce anybody into a decision and raise their hand and altar call and all that silly stuff, you know. But at the same time, I think we get so far, we're extremists by nature, we get so far away from some things that we just forget that, man, hey, Jesus was really clear. The time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Okay, that was like, you have a decision to make here, folks. Go and sin no more. You have a decision, do it or not. These are all coming out of his mouth. I think he drew, you know, let him without sin cast the first stone. I think there are so many things that Jesus did where he called people to a decision. And I think really, if you're really believing the sovereignty of God, you should be comfortable with it. And that's a whole paradigm shift, I know. But if you really believe that God predestines those who he knows are his before the creation of the world, that he is not up there, you know, please say yes. You know, he's not just like second horse in the third race, please choose me. If you, if you really believe that, then you should feel comfortable knowing that, man, hey, I'm not going to let this guy just make a false profession of faith here, but I'm not going to not let him make a decision if he's convict, convicted by the Holy Spirit to repent and believe. I think the question is, are we asking him to make a decision about the right thing? If it's just like, man, hey, say this and you won't go to hell, yeah. Don't, don't do that decision. That comes back to the gospel presentation thing. But Steve Shadrach, a guy who's been kind of doing, you know, world missions recruitment and evangelism training for a long time, says this. What a great name also, Steve Shadrach. He says this, can you ask the golden question? The golden question is, after sharing the gospel with someone, do you want to receive Christ as Lord and Savior today? Then shut your mouth and let the Holy Spirit work in those awkward three or four seconds that seem like an eternity. We often make great arguments for the faith. We can tell people all about Jesus. We can forget to call them to, a, but we can forget to call them to a decision. This is one of, the, one of the most important aspects for any gospel conversation because this question brings them to a moment of crisis. Shadrach says this: I believe the main reason many students or anybody else you're sharing with have never received Christ in their lives because no one has ever individually shared the gospel with them in a personal way and asked the golden question and waited for a response. So I think that's one of the important things and I think it's probably one of the most, outside of getting the conversation going, it's the next most fearful thing to do. Is to go through the gospel let them see their desperate need for Jesus Christ, explain to them why He is the only way, and then bring them to that place of what would keep you from repenting, explain what repenting is, and believing by faith in Christ right now, and then just zip it. Because here's the thing. That tells you what to do next. <laughs> if you would just do that, because they may be like, man, I'm just not ready. It's like, okay, you know what? We're going to start this. We're going to keep doing this evangelistic Bible study. We're going to, once you start coming to church, kind of just take it in. Or they may say, man, you know what? There's nothing keeping me. <coughs> and they pray to receive Christ. And you come in, you make sure they know, hey, that prayer didn't save you. See, this is where that truly believing in the sovereignty of God comes in. But here's how we'll know if the fruit of the Spirit has taken residence in your heart, or the Spirit has taken residence in your heart by the fruit of the Spirit playing itself out through love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, a disdain for sin, a love for the body, a new person. Let's talk about that. Let's go and get to know other Christians. 
You see where I'm going with that. But I think you miss out on all those things and you just kind of get, end up having to move on to the next relationship or conversation because you never bring them to that point and ask them that awkward question, what would keep you from right now repenting and believing? And then the last part is the same as the event, is following up appropriately. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, but we, were proved, but we proved to be gentle among you as, nursing, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives as well, because you have become so very dear to us. That's 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. I think this is one of my favorite verses on understanding the process of evangelism from a biblical perspective. So sometimes I'll get the person, and I'm an evangelist, so I'm always just shotgunning people with the gospel any chance I get. But sometimes people get, you know, in conversation, I'll tell them about the relational process of evangelism we're doing. They're like, oh, no, man, you just got to go, go, go. I was like, yeah, well, Paul, you know, he said he was delighted to share with you not only the gospel. That was a prerequisite. Like, I'm, I'm going to share the gospel. <laughs> I'm Paul. <laughs> of course I am. But I imparted to you my life as well. And when I think about the most appropriate follow-up for us as we're taking people through the process of evangelism, is this living life with them. You know, Daryl shared his testimony earlier. And when he was having that crisis of faith in his own life and the, the fruit of the gospel is coming out that those guys shared with him, he knew exactly where to go. It wasn't because they just had one conversation with him. It's because they had study groups and they were hanging out after class and they were, they were giving their life away to them. Now that took away from some of their time and their comfort it may take away some of your money. It may take away from where you live. It may take away from what you had planned to do that week. But if we really want to see people come to know Christ, not only do we have to, it's a prerequisite, we have to share the gospel. It's the only way people come to Christ. But we have to impart to them our lives as well. And really embody that life-on-life -life evangelism. So keep showing up. Get them around other believers. You know, here's one of the most profound things, I think, when I think about how to have impact. Have fun with people. Uh, that's huge. <laughs> I think some of the times that's where we as Christians just don't get it. We don't know how to have fun. And I think we can all find some amoral activity we can do with somebody. You know, for me, I'm from that side of Nashville, so if it involves orange, I can find something we can unite on like, in a like-minded way. But have fun with people. That's the one way to really earn, earn the right to share with them again and again and again. Use your dinner table as a tool. And last but not least, I think there are times where you just dust the, the, uh, dust the dirt off your sandals and move on. And you just let them know, hey, man, this guy knows where I can find me. He doesn't want to have anything to do. He's not coming to anything else. <laughs> and it's time to move on. Not because I'm some mean person who doesn't want to see them come to Christ, but because I, there's other fish out there who I need to catch, and he's not responding to the gospel. And so I hope those things are helpful and just to help maybe give some practical ideas in your mind and thoughts of how to get out there and share the good news. I got about, let's just take about 10 minutes. Are there any this practical questions, things we can interact over at all? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in all I, I think the way you said it is perfect. If if we're in the right places, that's the question we need to be asking is like, man, hey, this guy is I purposely went to this place that's not a Bible Belt part of the world or even this town of Jackson or wherever you are. 
So this guy's coming out of a background where it's like, man, I don't even know what VBS stands for. You know what I mean? I think that some of the things we've done is we've just taken that wheel diagram. Have you guys familiar with the wheel diagram? Okay, it's a navigator tool. Again, Campus Outreach just steals everything from all the other ministries that started 50 years before us. But uh, Dawson Troutman, the founder of the Navigators, made the wheel diagram, and he related it to a bicycle wheel. And you have the hub, the power source. That's the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. But then the way he explains it as he sh shares it with the new believers, the way that that power source is extended out to the tires through the spokes. And those spokes are God's word, how he communicates to us, and prayer, how we talk back to him. And then fellowship, or the horizontal relationships, fellowship with the local church, and evangelism of the lost. And he just has different verses and stuff that we go, so Campus Outreach has made something, just a simple, we call it the blue book, <laughs> very creative. And uh, we just go through, okay, week one, what does it mean to truly be saved? So you go through a biblical account of conversion. Week two, the Lordship of Christ. Week three, getting into God's Word. What is it? What is God's Word? You know, so I think there's lots of good tools out there, and I think that's where we as the, even the body need to sometimes just be willing to make the tool. You know what I mean? And be like, hey, this guy didn't know anything. It's like I can't find anything that's appropriate, so I'm just going to go through these four or five things with him. But I think that's where you just being a laborer. What's labor? That word labor kind of has a connotation to it of this is work you know and I think that's what it is and so I think that's the kind of thing would you agree with that Daryl that we just have a lot of simple little tools that we've kind of made but there's tons of good stuff out there for following up and things like that but and then two I think just getting around other believers it just one it proves if they're genuinely saved or not because if you're if you've really been converted you just can't get enough like Oh man, you're one of those Christian people too? Yes, I want to be around you. We have nothing in common, but that doesn't matter. I just, I, th I think that's a big thing. It's a good, great question. Any others? Yes. I think our small groups would be a good place to really practice our one minute testimony. I think that's a great thing. Time the pump, would you give us a one minute testimony? Yeah. Um, I grew up in a home where it was in southern Indiana. And so most people went to church, but uh, for me, as I grew up, church kind of wore off and uh, wasn't really that scared of hell anymore because I thought that's not going to happen for a long time. And I prayed to receive Christ when I was little. And so I started to live my life around being the successful basketball and football player and dating the cheerleader and getting the acclamations from my community. And was really a happy guy and went off to college just so I didn't have to go to work. And uh, it was there a guy on campus met me and asked me, hey, if you died tonight, where would you go? And I realized, man, I do not have a great answer. I said, I think heaven, like seven out of 10. He's like, and he said, so there's a 30% chance. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I just said that. And he shared with me how God is holy and perfect and has laws that we're to follow. And I clearly have broken those laws. And I was made to live out those laws for my joy and happiness, but I've broken them a million times over. And he's just, and I deserve his punishment, but he put that punishment on Jesus Christ, who is himself, who came, he came as a man and took on our punishment like no other man could. And said, if I receive that gift and I receive him as Lord and Savior of my life, I'll be saved. And since then, my life has been transformed. I've the things I used to love, now I hate. The things I used to hate, now I love. And so then I would just go on into the other things. But I think that's a great idea. So think about those things in small groups. Is maybe have a testimony workshop month where you're just going over. Okay, let's practice. Let's you you play the lost person at the grocery store. I'll be me. You know, and let's flip flop and do those things. Yep. When I met Christ, and then what's happened since I met Christ. Yeah. And you could do a book size, but to get it down to one page, that's a challenge. Yeah. Now, it takes work. I mean, you really do have to. That's why we do the workshop. I know Tommy's been through it, Steve's been through it. And uh, so those are some guys you all can get with. But that is, you're, you're right. I mean, it, 
that's why I think we got to come back to it and be like, okay, this isn't elementary stuff because if it was, then we'd be doing it all the time. But we got to get back to like, okay, I need to put some effort into the personal testimony and personal evangelism. Any other questions? Uh huh. Yeah. Again, I think it comes back to, you know, there's people that don't like them, and so I ask them what they use, and they're like, well, you know, I just kind of, uh, I don't do anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, I think the thing is, is any opportunity you can get to get a thing going, yeah, why not do it? I personally like to use them at times, but most of the time I don't, but I'm also gifted to where I can comfortably just jabber and get into the conversation. So I think, again, it's a tool. If it, if this hammer helps me get the nail in the wood faster, I would say use it. If you have like hands made of hammers and you don't need it, then you can, you know. But uh, was, the illustration kind of ended. But uh, I think that's the thing with gospel tracks is if it's a helpful tool, it can't be wrong. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yes, I believe mm-hmm. that. I believe that. No pruning life, no church involvement. Yep. And at the end of the conversation, you feel like I've said everything. And he's agreed with everything. He's agreed with it. <laughs> yeah. And your life is totally different. What do you say to that person? Yeah. That's nine out of ten people at Tennessee Tech. Uh, honestly, I mean, would you agree? Guys? You guys agree with that? Two Tennessee Tech guys right there. And I would say this. I'd say, oh, cool, man, let's go share our faith. I was like, great, hey, some of us are getting together at 7 a.m. Friday to pray for Dubai. Hey, you know what I mean? And if it's the first time I met them, I'll say some of those things. Well, hey, man, we're having this fellowship. You should come. But then after two or three weeks, I think as I, and if this is someone I'm interacting with that I'm going to see more than once, I, I just, again, full of truth and grace, but hey, man, you're giving me all the right answers, but I don't see any fruit in your life. And I, this is very uncomfortable for me to say this to you, but are you sure you're a Christian? One of the best guys that's good at asking that question is sitting right next to you, Steve Sobakin. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, and, and if it's a thing where, and if I'm not going to ever see him again, I just go ahead and lay it on the line and be like, hey man, well listen, it sounds like you have all the things, right answers, but are these things like real in your life? Do they really, does it, your life, you know, when Jesus Christ is your Lord, that means he lords over you. Everything in your life revolves around him. And uh, so I think more than anything, don't be a prey. You don't have anything to lose to offend that guy. And that's probably what most of the people in our culture need. But you start asking them to do some of those things that you got to be a Christian when I get up at seven and pray for Dubai. You know what I mean? It's like. Um, so I'm going to take that one and um, chatting it up with, with the question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm usually looking for the connection. Like they have Skittles, like, man, I love Skittles. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. You know, that's not that simple, but that practical. And uh, so I got 20 seconds, like, so, you know, I'm trying to think of, I got, yeah. <laughs> See, you, you, you guys already know the answers, it's that easy. I think I got so many weird stories like this of me doing different things, but more times than not, I'm just straight on, like, hey, I'm a Christian, and you know, when I meet random people, I just like to ask them what their spiritual beliefs are. What, you have anything that you believe and, and it sounds awkward but it's more awkward to sit there for keep them in line and keep them from going where they need to go because you're talking about the weather does that make sense and so I think more times than not and you know when I take you guys out sharing your faith everybody's always like oh my gosh you just went right into it I was like yeah we got right into it and they were more comfortable than you were you know what I mean and it didn't feel like that on this side but I think more times than not, if you just are really genuine and you'd be like, hey, you know what, I'm just a Christian and I just like to talk to people about what, they, kind of what their viewpoints are and stuff. Do you have a spiritual background? 
If you ask them that question, do you have a church background? Do you have a spiritual background? It's not an offensive question. It's, you're asking about their life. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, really? Yeah. What is your background? And any awkwardness that was there at the beginning goes away. Uh, now, that being said, I'm probably awkward in my own presentation of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm, okay, I'm probably comfortable with my awkwardness. But I think if you just make the connection and then you just are... I heard somebody say it like this. It's kind of like the guy who's going around the castle with a wall and you're just looking for that weak spot. And as soon as you see it, you enter in. So I think that's the thing. Is like, hey, you know, hey, UT jacket. You like the Vols? Yeah, I love the Vols. Go Vols. Vols for life. Awesome, man. Well, yeah, I'm a campus minister over there at Tennessee Tech. I work with athletes and stuff. And, man, there's a lot of neat things going on with UT with the team chaplain. You got any kind of spiritual backgrounds? And so I'm just swinging that thing. And uh, I would like to say I've been like that from day one, but it's not. It's got training. I got out there and I messed up a whole bunch. I looked really foolish many times. But I think that's pleasing to the Lord when we go out there and make fools of ourselves. So, yeah. On the other side of that, um, in my personal life, I, I'm, I'm a pretty bold person. I don't have much of a problem with doing that, but the Lord's teaching me right now more relational. Than yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mostly my spirit of influence is at the gym and I, I still do short lists of people who I see every single day and when you you come right out like one per particular person I'm thinking I told him when he told me he's an agnostic I was like well you know I'm going to try to change that and so we've talked about the gospel and, uh -huh. I, but I also want to be I don't want him to feel like he's a mission project to me yeah. every time I see him I've got my evangelist six go you know we talk about yeah. these things and how do you keep you shared that you, uh -huh. know, you keep bringing it back without yeah. being yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's, the, again, I always come back to my zero term hour illustration. Okay, like, man, I'm, I've got no problem over here in the truth sector. We're going strong. It's, it comes up every time. But you know what? We need, God's put this guy on my heart, this girl on my heart. We need to do something. Let's have something at the house where we, and they say no. Okay, well, let's try this. And they say, you know what I mean? You just keep trying things that are relationally community oriented in order to kind of keep winning the opportunity to keep going with it there with the person. So I think that's the thing is that, again, it's laboring, it's laborious, it's going to take time and effort and mental labor even to think through, okay, what are some of those things I can do just to practically keep in contact and not make the only subject? What's the amoral activity that we can connect on, you know what I mean, to do and to build community and live life together in situations? And so I think that's the thing, or you know, so and sometimes it's just, you know, if it's a guy at the gym for your case scenario, you can't, can't do too much, <laughs> you know. So, that's so that's just where you're just okay with, I'll just be the weird Christian lady that guy I met at the gym, and <laughs> when it, he'll thank you, you in heaven. It's the opposite sex. You can't, like, I'd love to say, hey, let's go have proximity. Right, right. I think, again, I, that's where you just bring him. <laughs> that's a good question. I think there are some times where you're okay just being the, you just, you don't have any options. So, we've got time for like one or two more. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so you're like, go get the darkest place. Like, yep. just go, like, chase it down. I'm scared of that. That means I'm going to hit it. Yep. That's what I'm going to go do. Yep. Just walk me through a couple of examples of you actually doing that. Because, like, you can't show up to, like, everyone smashed and you're like, uh -huh. what's up, guys? Yep. And all of a sudden, yep. it's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. If you're showing up and everybody has their bear goggles on, it's like, man, everybody wants to talk about spiritual things, but <laughs> none of them remember it. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I think I think I understand where you're coming from. I think that's where again, you're using strategy and thought, and you're saying, okay, you know what? F for example, with me, I do a lot with fraternities. You know, they they have a certain lifestyle they live on the campus that's pretty consistent on every campus. And uh, so for me, it's like, man, I'm not going to show up on Thirsty Thursday and start my Bible study at 10 o'clock at night because that's, you know what I mean, not very strategic. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the president and be like, hey, man, listen, you're probably weird. You probably don't have many Christian ministers come in here, but I just think there's a little leadership study of Jesus I could do that could help the leadership and the you know, overall productivity of you guys on campus. You know, would you care if I just came to the chapter meeting and invite anybody who's interested to come 
And if you're not, don't worry, don't feel bad, but if there are guys interested. And so I go do that. I've done this for 15 years this exact same way. I go, the, I've never been turned down one time. And they're all like, yeah, man, come on, dude, whatever. You know what I mean? So I go in there. I'm at the chapter meeting. They're all sitting there smoking cigarettes and everything like that. And I'm like, what's up, guys? My name is Mason. I'm just doing a little, you know, four-week study on what it means to be a leader according to Jesus. And they know I'm just, it's not bait and switch. It's just a smart name for it. They know I'm going to talk about Jesus and getting saved and all that stuff. I mean, it's like Tennessee Tech for crying out loud. You know what I mean? Everybody's from Mount Juliet, Tennessee, which is, you know, not a pagan society. And, uh, but every time it's like, and I, and I just make it optional. Hey, everyone wants to come, come. We know we're going to have pizza there and da-da-da. Every week, 10 guys show up. You know, and it maybe dwindle as the time goes on or whatever, but then two or three guys come to Christ, and then I teach them how to start it up the next year. And it's really no different than what the guys did in Etau, the video of the guys who went to Papua New Guinea, and they just dropped in, and they started learning the language and how to catch pigs and eat them, and asked the chief if he could teach him how to cut the pig open. And Have you guys ever seen that video? It's really awesome. But uh, talk to Steve. He's the one that showed it to me, I think. Um, but you just kind of get in there, then, but then you figure out a way. Again, it's just like the event evangelism. I told her, it was like, hey, I'm looking for that opening. I'm going to do the same thing. When I moved to Salt Lake City, I'm not just going to set up a shop like, how to you know, debunk Mormonism and, and, and better your life. You know, It's like, oh, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to figure out the community and understand the culture a little bit, and I'm going to figure out, okay, where are the places that, Within, even within here that I can o open up some doors and see what, ha you know what I'm saying? And so, I hope that helps at all. Last one, Nathan. Yeah, I think uh, if we have a target, we also know a lot of things. Yeah. And what they mean. Yep. So, like, for instance, if, he's, if the custodian, one guy who's over in Tropical Frat, and they have all the dirt around the house, uh, he might let us bring some food to <laughs> Yep. You can take four or five guys. Yep. Say, hey, look, I'll, we're going to come over and help you clean up tomorrow at noon because we will not be conscious before that. Yep. Um, but we will not do it for you. You have to help us. We're going to do it together. You're going to spend a couple, three hours cleaning up. Yep. You're, you're right there with them all the time. You're building that relationship. You can say something. Yep. If you could just be inventive a little bit. Yep. And what that means there. So, I mean, that's ingenious right there, one. But I think that's the thing is like, just being creative on how can I find those amoral things I can do to connect with them and get on common ground. Sounds like you have a reference point there if you need any help on ideas from Nathan. But that's a great idea. All right, I'm going to pray for us, and I'll stick around here a minute if anybody has any more questions, but I don't want to keep you here all day. I, I can talk about this stuff for a long time. So, Father God, thank you so much that there would be this many people who take time out of their usually probably restful afternoons to learn more about what it means to labor and go to work and give their life away <coughs> for reaching others for your glory. I pray you'd raise up workers in this room for your harvest field and for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Guys, thank you so much. Appreciate it.